Good morning. It is Sunday morning, November the 1st, 2020, and I'd like to extend a welcome to you for coming here to visit with us at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. I'm so glad you're joining us by the internet and by your computer, and you can take part in the service today. Just by way of reminder, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of my message today. So if you have a piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice set aside, you'll be ready to go. If you want to take a few minutes and go ahead and get that now, that would be fine. But make sure you're ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us as we remember what Jesus did for us. By way of announcement, just remember that Tuesday is Election Day. And if you haven't voted early, I really encourage you to vote. It's your right to vote. We're in a free democratic country, so take the opportunity to vote if you haven't done so already uh, early. My wife and I have both already voted, so we're all done, and the polls will open early Tuesday morning. So make your vote count and go ahead and make sure you fulfill that obligation. Also, by way of announcement, uh, Monday, 1 o'clock at the Parsonage is the Ladies' Bible Study. So if you'd like to go and be blessed, they're studying the book of Joshua and going through there. The ladies are really loving it and enjoying it. Just give Brenda a call if you are coming, if you haven't come before, so we can make room for you. Again, we're observing social distancing. People are wearing masks and the chairs are set six feet apart so we can be protective toward one another. One way of loving one another is being concerned about another person's health. That's why we're following the strict guidelines that the United Methodist Church has marked out for us. This time we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll go into the word of God. Father, how we thank you for a brand new fresh day, a brand new month as we look forward to the Thanksgiving season and just a brand new day claiming the truth that your mercies are new every single morning. Father, I thank you so much we don't have to face this life alone, but we have a sure word from heaven contained in the word of God and the Bible. Help us to never forget that, Father, and daily feast in your word and water ourselves with the scriptures. Father, thank you so much that you've told us that every scripture is inspired of God. It is literally God-breathed. And thank you for the sacredness of the book we hold so dear. Open our hearts now, open our minds to understand what you have for us, and I pray you would use me to communicate the truth that you've laid on my heart. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. Folks, there were two elderly men that used to play chess together. That's how they passed their time. They were both really good at chess, and it happened that one day that both of them contracted a real bad bug and got sick. Both of them decided the wisest thing they could do would be to go to the doctor, get a prescription, and then go to the pharmacist. Well, they both went to the doctor at separate times, both got prescriptions. One man went and filled his prescription, took his medication, overcame the sickness, and was healthy. The other man was a little bit on the frugal side. You could say he was somewhat tight. In fact, it was told when he pulled a dollar bill out of his pocket, Washington blinked the sunlight. He was tight. He really was. And he said, you know, I can get over this. I don't need to spend the money on the cost of the prescription. I can beat it on my own. So he took a few home remedies. He got sicker and sicker. And sadly, he passed away and died. What's so sad is he had the prescription for health right in his pocket. All he had to do was go to the drugstore and pay the cost of the prescription and he could have been healthy. But his frugalness, his tightness, caused him from wanting to spend the money, and he wound up dying. And if you die, what good is your money to you then anyway? Well, I've got a prescription today that's going to be really good to maintain the health of all of us here in the church. But in order for that prescription to work, each one of us has to take it. You know, you cannot interact with people. You can't go to church for a long period of time. You can't be involved in Bible studies and spend time with other Christians without us stepping on one another's toes occasionally. And sometimes some of us have different personality traits and it could be a little bit and rub against somebody else's personality traits. I heard one pastor say one time, to live above with saints in love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, brother, that's a different story. 
And sometimes it is hard to get along, but Jesus really gave us a prescription of how to get along in Matthew chapter 18. So if you would please turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to talk about relationships, how to get along with one another, and also tackle the subject of forgiveness. And I titled this message, The Art of Forgiveness, because I believe there's very, very much an artistic way to forgive, be free, and let people go when they've offended you. So Matthew chapter 18, let's take a look at what Jesus says here in verse 15. You'll notice if you have a red letter edition that these words are read. They're put there because these are the very words of Jesus himself as they're recorded in the scriptures. Jesus says, look verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Folks, I could not overemphasize that last clause, just between the two of you. You know what normally happens when somebody gets offended, somebody gets hurt, somebody says a caustic or a nasty word about somebody? They tend to withdraw, and what do they do? They go and tell their best friend about it. Do you know what Myrtle said to me? Do you know what Harold did the other day? And their other friend listens, and of course they're their friends, so they're going to take their side and shake and say, oh, that was terrible what he said. That was terrible, the thing he did to you. Wasn't that just terrible? And before you know it, that can all spread as a word of gossip and create a lot of discontent among the body of Christ, among believers. You know, way, way back in the book of Proverbs, it says that God hates those who sow discord among brethren. So if somebody offends you, don't tell your best friend, don't tell your spouse, don't tell anybody else. What does Jesus say? He says clearly, just between the two of you. If your brother or your sister sins against you, go and show him his or her fault just between the two of you. And folks, I can tell you from being a chaplain in the prison setting, from being a pastor here at the church, when people do that, it usually takes care of the problem. The little fire is put out, the little spark that was there that can cause contention. People are able to talk and work their way through what happened. There's generally an apology, and things go on great. So if we follow that kind of advice, we can snip a lot of things in the beginning before they blow up into something big. Try to snip the fuse on the dynamite before it blows up and the whole room goes up. Now, you might be out there thinking right now, Dave knows what I've been doing. Dave knows that I said this, and he's preaching this just to me. No, that's not the truth. Remember, I started out talking about a prescription. This is a prescription. I don't know of anybody here, to the best of my knowledge, that I know that's talking about anybody else or gossiping. I don't know a thing. We are a church that loves one another, and we get along. This is a prescription when the time does come that we can put it into the action to preserve the unity of the church. So Jesus' instructions is go and show him his fault alone just between the two of you. Keep it private. Now, what happens if he won't listen? Well, Jesus says that in the second part of verse 15. He says, if he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. It's interesting, Jesus says if he doesn't want to listen to you, if he doesn't want to reconcile and right the relationship, then you take two or three witnesses with you and talk about it with the other people there to serve as witnesses to what's going on. What's interesting is that quote, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established, that was part of the ancient Mosaic law when you went into a formal court proceeding. You would have to have at least two or three witnesses for the truth to be established. And that was a way the Israelites handled their courts back in ancient times. Moses wrote that out in the first five books of the, of the law, the Pentateuch. That's how you do it. You do it with witnesses. So Jesus says if a one-on-one -on -one won't do it, then you take a couple people with you. Why? That's the legal way to do things, and you're doing it properly and in order. Then it says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. You might have to bring the matter up to the church. 
and bring it before the church and bring it before the pastor and administrative leaders or people like that and see if you can settle it that way. If he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So there's a process to go through when an, when an, an offense happens. Sadly, so many times what I've seen is somebody will say something to somebody and instead of that person confronting that person and trying to settle it out, they'll just make a decision to leave. Well, I'm never going back to that church again after that happened. I guarantee you, no matter what church you go to, no matter where you work, no matter what the situation might be, you'll find people there. And people are sinners. We all make mistakes and we're bound to step on one another's toes. But I think if we follow Jesus' example here and keep it just between the two of you, we can clip a lot of wrongs and make them right. We can straighten things out. If they won't listen, there's a process to go through. But I found that most times you never really have to get that far because somebody will just take off and leave and they think that withdrawing is the way to go. And what's sad, when you withdraw, you cut yourself off from blessing. You cut yourself off from the fellowship and the encouragement of fellow believers. You cut yourself off from really having something good that can minister to you and encourage you. Remember Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And during this time of COVID and everything, there are you folks that are watching at home. We understand, but remember, use that telephone, use that email, make sure you're having fellowship with other people do, do Zoom meetings and things like that, whatever you can to have fellowship with other believers because it's so, so important. Then Jesus goes on. Let's go on to the next verse. He says, I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Heaven sees what's going on. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heaven will be in full agreement when you try to reconcile with your brother. Then he says, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I also in the midst. God is going to be with the women tomorrow at the ladies' Bible study. God will be with you when you meet together maybe with one other couple or one other person and pray. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. Now, you all know the bombacity of the Apostle Peter. Peter's always one to talk. He's always one to put his foot in his mouth. He's always one to say so. So when he's here thinking about all this stuff Jesus is saying about interacting and forgiving your brother, he comes up with a question. Look at verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? You know what's interesting? The rabbis around the time of Jesus' day, the Jewish rabbis, some said you should forgive two times, some said you could forgive three times, but then others said you just write them off if that's the situation. You don't even worry about them anymore. You just write it off and don't have any type thing to do with them if they do it more than three times. Peter says seven times, the number of completion, and look how Jesus answers. A very, very familiar uh, statement. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven, 490 times. And I don't believe Jesus meant that as a literal number. It's a number he gives the idea that you forgive every offense that comes your way. Folks, isn't one of the blessed things that you and I experience by being a Christian, the fact that by the cross of Jesus, all of our sins are completely forgiven. God forgives every mistake, every transgression, every sin, all the wrong we've done our entire life on the cross. And he expects us to follow him and be a person that's willing to forgive. You know what I found sometimes over the years, folks? If somebody offends you and you don't forgive, you wind up stewing in your own pot of juices. You replay conversations, you think about them in a negative light, you keep holding on to it and harboring it, and all it does is slowly eat you up from the inside. Where if you forgive and let it go, you can be free. 
If you harbor, think about harbor, the end, bar, you find yourself behind bars. But if you forgive, you find yourself free as a bird. And you can go on with your life and not let it bother you anymore because you've forgiven it. Now look at this beautiful illustration that Jesus gives about forgiveness. Verse 23, he says, Therefore, based upon forgiven your brother seven times seven, based upon handling offenses in the correct way, remember first, you go to him and him alone. Second, if you won't listen, you take two or three witnesses. Third, you go to the church. If they still won't listen, then you consider that you just have to treat him as somebody that doesn't know the Lord because they're refusing the counsel of others to get together. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle account with his servants. Now that word servants there can also be translated slaves. Back in biblical times, a wealthy king could have slaves that had to work for him, but he also would be willing to loan them money that if they had little businesses or little ventures on the side, where they could earn a little bit of spending money, they could do that. So King would be known to lend people money, to lend his slaves money, so they could make a little bit of money, and of course they would pay him back with interest. It was a common practice back in those days. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now look at this. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, 10,000 talents back in those days was a huge sum of money. Some have estimated it might have been well over a million dollars that this servant owed. Go on, verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. Remember back in biblical times, a slave was actually your property. So the king says, well, you don't have the money to pay me back. I'm going to sell you, your wife, and your children, everything you have, and I can at least recoup a little bit of my money, and you can go on and be a slave for somebody else. He says, that's what's going to happen, because you can't pay me back this huge amount of sum that you owe me. Now let's go on. The servant fell on his knees, literally fell flat before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay everything. Please give me some patience. He humbles himself, he goes down to his knees, he worships before this king, he does him homage, and says, please be patient with me, I'll pay back everything. And look at verse 27. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Folks, could you forgive somebody that owed you over a million dollars and they refused to pay? Maybe you've had a business dealing with somebody before, another Christian, and they ripped you off. They never paid what they owed you. Do you still think about it? Or are you able to forgive them? You know, one thing that I personally experienced is when Carol and I got married, I owned a home over in San Mateo and she owned a home here in Interlochen. And we made the decision since her home was bigger and her roots were so intertwined in this church, I knew I could not pull Carol out of this church. Too much love, too many relationships, roots down the size of oak trees with her in this church. I knew we had to go to continue going to this church with her with a bigger home. It made better sense. So I decided to put my house up on the market. Well, it didn't sell, it didn't sell, and finally this young man called me, begging me to rent it to him. And I didn't want to rent it, I really wanted to sell it, but he called back a second time, he called back a third time. So finally I decided I would be a landlord and rent my home out to him, and then maybe consider it selling down the road. Well, for two or three months, everything went fine, he paid the rent, it was good. And when the fourth month came around, he gives me a call that a customer had written him a bad check in his business and he couldn't afford to pay me all, but if he paid me half, he'd pay me the second half a couple weeks later. And he did do that. A couple more months went by, everything was good. But then again, he came into hard times, didn't have the money, didn't have the money, didn't have the money. And he finally just made the decision to move, owing me around six or $700. And I thought bad about it for a while, and it kind of bothered me. I kind of kept it in my soul a little bit and kind of chewed on it. And after a while, I thought, you know, 
I have a decision to make right here in this instance. I can keep thinking about him. I can think about the hundreds of dollars that I've lost, or I can choose to forgive and let it go, cut my losses and move on. And that's what I decided to do. I forgave him. I forgave the girl he was with. I let it all go and cut my losses. And I thought God has always provided for me. God has always taken care of me. I'm going to trust God that he'll continue to provide and just move on. And now it doesn't bother me at all. It happened. So a big deal. I forgave it. I let him go. Let's see what this guy did here that was forgiven so, so much. Verse 28. But when that servant, the one who was forgiven millions of dollars, look at this, that servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii, a denarii was basically one day's wage. So this other servant basically owed him about a hundred days of labor, a little over three months. What does he do? He grabbed him and began to choke him, literally seizes him by the throat and he's shaking him. And he says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, remember, just like he did to the king, okay? Uh, and uh, Be patient with me, I'll pay you back. Give me some patience. He received mercy. Here's a guy owing him a lot less. He's asking for mercy. But he refused. Instead, he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. You know, back in biblical times and even in England up until around the 1650s, 1700s, there was debtor's prison. If you couldn't pay your debts, if you couldn't pay your bills, you went off to prison. They had debtor's prison these days. Probably half the country would be in debtor's prison with it. Okay, with people, money they owe, you know. A lot of people are spending money they don't even have to keep up with people they don't even like. So think about that, you know. And, uh, but here's debtor's prison. This guy's thrown into it. Well, you know, people see what goes on. You can't do anything without somebody else seeing you. And the other servants that are around, look what happens. Verse 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. They let the king know. They let him know about the situation, about what had happened. Then the master's response, verse 32, the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Notice he's delivered over to torturers, people that probably back in that day would have racked him and did other things. Let me ask you a question. You're stretched out on a torture rack. Somebody's turning the screws and saying, are you going to pay now? No, I can't. Tighten him down further. No, I can't. How are you going to pay if you're on a torture rack? Doesn't make any sense, but that's what happened because of his unforgiveness. And look what it says. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Genuine forgiveness. Folks, the way I look at it this way is if on the cross when Jesus died, he forgave me of all the sins I've ever committed. 65 years of life and living, making mistakes, sinning, transgressions. If God can forgive me for all that, who am I to hold such a slight offense against somebody else? Can I be like Jesus and be willing to forgive, be quick to forgive and realize that I'm just a human too? We all fall short. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We always slight people from time to time without even knowing it. In fact, this past week, I had a young man come into my office and tell me he'd been offended by something I'd said in a message. And I told him I was so sorry. I didn't realize that was offensive. Please forgive me. And he said he was willing to forgive me and let it go. Be willing quickly to apologize, quickly, even if you feel like you haven't done anything wrong, to keep that relationship going. 
because you only have one of two options. You can think about it, you can stew in your own juices, you can replay conversations in your mind, you can think about that person in a negative way, and all it really does is eat you up on the inside. That person's living their life, they might not even be aware of the offense, they're doing their own thing and they could care less, but you're the one that's stewing in your own little boiling pot of pity. Don't do that. Make a choice to forgive. And when you forgive, you will find that you are the prisoner that's being set free. Doesn't mean that person's off the hook. That person will have to one day answer to the Lord for how they behaved, what they did. They'll face their own day on Judgment Day like we all will. But you'll be free as you've forgiven to move on with your life. And there's nothing more better than being at peace, being in contented, and knowing that you are forgiven and you've forgiven those around you. I'd like to you to bow your head for just a few minutes. If you're there at home, please do this also. Bow your head and try to think about maybe something that you're hanging on to, an old grudge that you're bearing, somebody that offended you and bothered you. Have you really forgiven that person? Pray that God would give you the grace right now to forgive that person, to let it go, not let it fester in your soul, and be free to walk in newness of life. Pray the Lord would help you to do that by his grace and his power. Let me pray with you. Father, we know that when we hold on to grudges, it's so easy to think bad, to feel miserable, and to turn bitter inside. And you tell us in the book of Hebrews that we should not allow a root of bitterness to grow up and defile many people through it. Help us to let that go, to forgive that person, to forgive the situation, putting it into your hands, and being free to walk in the newness of life that you offer us. Father, if you can forgive us all our sins a lifetime long, who are we to hold such a small thing against somebody else? You'll provide for us, you'll take care of us, and we can know we're gonna be okay. So help us, Lord, to forgive and be like Jesus was. Help us, Lord, to let it go and not let it stay deep down inside. Help me, Father, help us all to forgive those that have offended us. And it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Do you feel good this morning? Don't you feel cleansed and forgiven that you've let it go? You're free. You're the prisoner that's been set free when you forgive somebody else. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it get to your head. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. I think that's why Jesus says, my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. We'll have that bitterness. Don't let that bitterness soak into your soul. You know, this time now we're going to move into having the Lord's Supper. And isn't the Lord's Supper all about forgiveness? When Jesus held up the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember his death till he comes. The whole Christian faith is built upon God forgiving us through Jesus Christ. So at this time, I'm going to get a piece of bread as we observe this sacrament. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Father, how we thank you for the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the nails that pierced his hands and his feet, the spear that pierced his side, the crown of thorns that was beaten down upon his forehead. Thank you that his body was broken that we might live through him. Help us never to take his sacrifice for granted, Lord, but realize what it cost Jesus in giving his very life. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
Folks, all the way back in the book of Leviticus, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The debt had to be paid for. And praise God, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid that debt by shedding his own blood. Peter says, it was not with perishable things that you were redeemed, with silver and gold after the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus said, this is my blood, which is poured out for many, the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Let's partake. Father, thank you so much for the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of God himself when he shed on the cross. And thank you, Father, by his blood we are sanctified and made righteous. Lord, I think of the verse in Hebrews that says, For by one sacrifice he has perfected forever those that are being sanctified. And thank you for that justifying grace, just as if we never sinned, that is given to us because of the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you so much, Father, for your grace and your mercy and what you accomplished at the cross. And again, Lord, if you can forgive us for all the sins we ever have committed or will commit in the future, help us to be able to forgive others quickly and keep a settled account. Father, there's nothing better than being at peace with you and forgiving others. Help us to do so. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, just as a way of announcement, uh, any of you that perhaps are shut in, you're not able to get out of your house. If you would like me to come and have communion with you in your home, feel free to give us a call here at the church office, 684-6511. Speak to Brenda or speak to me. I have a little personal communion kit that I was given by a former Methodist pastor with four cups and a place for wafers and grape juice. And I'd be more than willing to come to your home and have communion with you one-on-one -on -one if you would like me to do that, if you feel more comfortable with that. If you're comfortable with doing the communion service the way we're doing it online, that's fine also. It's merely a preference or a choice. But do contact me and I'd be more than happy to come to your home and offer you the Lord's Supper. I've already done that with a couple of older ladies, uh, elderly ladies that are, that are shut in and everything and can't make the service, not able to drive. So please uh, give me a call if you would like to do that. Again, I'd like you to thank you for being with us. Thank you for partaking of the Lord's Supper. Continue to check the website from time to time as new insights come up. And I look forward to seeing you next week on Sunday, November the 8th. Be blessed and walk in the freedom of forgiveness.